love and death. In woodlands of the bright and early world, when love was to himself yet new and warm and stainless, played like morning with a flower, Ruru, with his young bride, Priyambada. Fresh-cheeked and dew-eyed, white Priyambada opened her budded heart of crimson bloom to love, to Ruru. Ruru, a happy flood of passion round a lotus dancing thrilled, blinded with his soul's waves, Priyambada. To him, the earth was a bed for this soul flower. To her, all the world was filled with his embrace. Wet with new rains, the morning earth, released from her fierce centuries and burning suns, lavished her breath in greenness. Poignant flowers thronged all her eager breast, and her young arms cradled a childlike bounding life that played and would not cease, nor ever weary grew of her bright promise. For all was joy and breeze and perfume, colour and bloom and ardent rays of living and delight desired the world. Then earth was quick and pregnant tamelessly. A free and unwalled race possessed her plains, whose hearts uncramped by bonds, whose unspoiled thoughts at once replied to light. Poison the fields, lonely and rich the forests, and the swaying of those unnumbered tops affected men with thoughts to their vast music kin. Undammed, the virgin rivers moved towards the sea, and mountains yet unseen, and peoples vague, winged young imagination like an eagle to strange beauty remote. And Ruru felt the sweetness of the early earth as sap all through him, and short life an eon made by boundless possibility. And love, sweetest of all, unfathomable love, a glory untired. As a bright bird comes, flying from airy extravagance to his own home and breasts his mate and feels her all his goal, so from boon sunlight and the fresh chill wave which swirled and lapped between the slumbering fields, from forest pools and wanderings mid leaves, through emerald ever new discoveries, mysterious hillsides ranged and buoyant swift, races with our wild brothers in the meads, came Ruru back to the white bosomed girl, strong wind to pleasure. She, all fresh and new, rose to him, and he plunged into her charm, for neither to her honey and poignancy artlessly interchanged, nor any limit to the sweet physical delight of her he found. Her eyes, like deep and infinite wells, lured his attracted soul, and her touch thrilled, not lightly, though so light, the joy prolonged and sweetness of the lingering of her lips was every time a nectar of surprise to her lover. Her smooth, gleaming shoulder, bared in darkness of her hair, showed jasmine bright, while her kissed bosom by rich tumults stirred was a moved sea that rocked beneath his heart. Then, when her lips had made him blind, soft siege of all her unseen body to his rule, betrayed the ravishing realm of her white limbs, an empire for the glory of a god. He knew not whether he loved most her smile, her causeless tears or little anger swift, whether held wet against him from the bath among her kindred lotuses, her cheeks, 
soft to his lips and dangerous happy breasts that vanquished all his strength with their desire, meeting his absence with her sudden face. Oh, when the leaf-hid bird at night complained near their wreathed arbor on the moonlit lake, sobbing delight out from her heart of bliss, or in his clasp of rapture, laughing low, of his close bosom bridled glad and pleased with passion, and this fiery play of love, or breaking off like one who thinks of grief, wonderful melancholy in her eyes, grown liquid and with wayward sorrow large. Thus he in her found a warm world of sweets and lived of ecstasy secure, nor deemed any new hour could match that early bliss. But love has joys for spirits born divine, more bleeding lovely than his thornless rose. That day he had left, while yet the east was dark, rising her bosom and into the river swam out, exulting in the sting and swift sharp-edged desire around his limbs, and sprang wet to the bank, and streamed into the wood as a young horse upon the pastures glad, feeds green sward, and the wind along his mane and arches as he goes his neck. So went in an immense delight of youth the boy, and shook his locks, joy crested. Boundlessly he rebelled in swift air of life, a creature of wide and vigorous morning. Far he strayed, tempting for flower and fruit, branches in heaven, and plucked and flung away, and brighter chose, seeking comparisons for her bloom, and followed new streams, and touched new trees, and felt slow beauty and leafy secret change. For the damp leaves, grey-green at first, grew pallid with the light, and warmed with consciousness of sunshine near. Then the whole daylight wandered in and made hard tracts of splendor and enriched all hues. But when a happy sheltered heat he felt and heard contented voice of living things harmonious with the noon, he turned and swiftly went homeward yearning to Priyambada. And near his home, emerging from green leaves, he laughed towards the sun. Oh, Father Sun, he cried, how good it is to live, to love. Surely our joy shall never end, nor we grow old, but like bright rivers or pure winds, sweetly continue or revive with flowers or live at least as long as senseless trees. He dreamed and said with a soft smile, Lo, she, and she will turn from me with angry tears, her delicate face more beautiful than storm or rainy moonlight. I will follow her and soothe her heart with sovereign flatteries, or rather all tyranny exhaust and taste the beauty of her anger like a fruit, vexing her soul with helplessness. Then, soften easily, with quiet, undenied demand of heart, insisting upon heart, or else will reinvest her beauty bright with flowers, or with my hands, her little feet persuade. Then will her face be like a sudden dawn, and flower compelled into reluctant smiles. He had not ceased when he beheld her. She, tearing a jasmine bloom with waiting hands, stood, drooping, petulant, but heard at once his footsteps, and before she was aware, a sudden smile of exquisite delight leaped to her mouth, and a great blush of joy surprised her cheeks. She, for a moment stood beautiful with her love before she died.
and he laughed towards her. With a pitiful cry, she paled, moaning, her stricken limbs collapsed. But petrified, in awful dumb surprise, he gazed. Then waking with a bound was by her all panic expectation. As he came, he saw a brilliant flash of coils evade the sunlight and with hateful gorgeous hood darted into green safety, hissing death. Voiceless, he sank beside her and stretched out his arms and desperately touched her face as if to attract her soul to live and sought beseeching with his hands her bosom. Oh, she was warm and cruel hope pierced him. But pale as jasmines, fading on a girl's sweet breast her cheek was and forgot its perfect rose. Her eyes that clung to sunlight yet with pain were large and feebly round his neck her arms she lifted and desiring his pale cheek against her bosom sobbed out piteously our love and stopped heartbroken then oh love alas the green dear home that I must leave so early. I was so glad of love and kisses and thought that centuries would not exhaust the deep embrace. And I have had so little of joy and the wild day and the throbbing night, laughter and tenderness and strife and tears. I have not numbered half the brilliant birds in one green forest, nor am familiar grown with sunrise and the progress of the eaves, nor have with plaintive cries of birds made friends, cuckoo and rain lark and love speak to me. I have not learned the names of half the flowers around me, so few trees know me by my name, nor have I seen the stars so very often that I should die. I feel a dreadful hand drawing me from the touch of thy warm limbs into some cold, vague mist, and all black night descends towards me. I no more am thine. But go, I know not where, and see pale shapes and gloomy countries and that terrible stream. O oh love, O oh love, they take me from thee far, and whether we shall find each other ever in the wide dreadful territory of death, I know not. O oh, thou wilt forget me quite, and life compel thee into other arms. Ah, come with me. I cannot bear to wander in that cold, cruel country all alone, helpless and terrified, or sob by streams denied sweet sunlight, and by thee unloved. Slower her voice came now, and over her cheek death paused. Then, sobbing like a little child, too early from her bounding pleasures called, the lovely, discontented spirit stole from her warm body white. Over her leaned Rudu and waited for dead lips to move. Still in the green wood lay Priyambara, and Ruru rose not from her, but with eyes emptied of glory hung above his dead. Only, without a word, without a tear. Then the crowned wives of the great forest came, they who had fed her 
from maternal breasts and grieved over the lovely body cold and bore it from him. Nor did he entreat one last look, nor one kiss, nor yet denied what he had loved so well. They, the dead girl, into some distant greenness bore away. But Ruru, while the stillness of the place remembered her, sat without voice. He heard through the great silence that was now his soul, the forest sounds, a squirrel's leap through leaves, the cheeping of a bird just overhead, a peacock with his melancholy cry complaining far away, and tossings dim and slight unnoticeable stir of trees. But all these were to him like distant things, and he alone in his heart's void. And yet no thought he had of her so lately lost, rather far pictures, trivial incidents of that old life before her delicate face had lived for him, dumbly distinct like thoughts of men that die, kept with long pomps his mind, excluding the dead girl. So still he was, the birds flashed by him with their swift small wings fanning him. Then he moved. Then rigorous memory through all his body shuddering awoke, and he looked up and knew the place and recognized greenness immutable, and saw old trees and the same flowers still bloom. He felt the bright indifference of earth and all the lonely uselessness of pain. Then, lifting up the beauty of his brow, he spoke with sorrow pale. O oh, grim, cold death, but I will not, like ordinary men, satiate thee with cries, and falsely woo thee, and make my grief thy theatre, who lie prostrate beneath thy thunderbolts, and make night witness of their moans, shuddering and crying, when sudden memories pierce them like swords, and often starting up as at a thought intolerable, pace a little, then sink down, exhausted by grief, agony. O oh, secrecy terrific, darkness vast at which we shudder. Somewhere, I know not where, somehow, I know not how, I shall confront thy gloom, tremendous spirit, and seize with hands and prove what thou art and what man, he said, and slowly to the forest wandered. There, long months he travelled, between grief and grief, reliving thoughts of her with every pace, measuring vast pain with his immortal mind, and his heart cried in him as when a fire roars through wide forests and the branches cry burning towards heaven in torture glorious. So burnt, immense, his grief within him. He raised his young pure face, all solemnized with pain, voiceless. Then fate was shaken and the gods grieved for him, of his silence grown afraid. Therefore, from peaks divine came flashing down immortal Agni, and to the Ashwatha tree cried in the voice that slays the world, O tree that liftest thy enormous branches, able to shelter armies, more than armies now shelter, be famous, house a brilliant god. For the grief grows in Ruru's breast up 
piled as wrestles with its anguished barricades in silence, an impending flood. And gods, immortal, grow afraid. For earth alarmed, shudders to bear the curse, lest her young life pale with eclipse and all creating love be to mere pain condemned. Divert the wrath into thy bows, Ashwatha. Thou shalt be my throne, glorious, though in eternal pangs, yet worth much pain. The young, pure destroyer's voice, and the dumb god consented silently. In the same noon came Ruru. His mind had paused, lured for a moment by soft, wandering gleams into forgetfulness of grief. For thoughts gentle and near-eyed, whispering memories upon his mind, the old, delightful times when he had called her by her liquid name, where the voice loved to linger. He remembered the champak bushes, where she turned away half-angered, and his speaking of her name masterfully, as to a lovely slave, rebellious, who has erred. At that, the slow yielding of her small head, and after a little, her sliding towards him, and beautiful, propitiating body, as she sank down with timid graspings, deprecatingly in prostrate warm surrender, her flushed cheeks upon his feet, and little touches soft, or her long name uttered beseechingly, and the swift leap of all her body to him, and eyes of large repentance, and the weight of her wild bosom, and lips unsatisfied, or hourly call for little trivial needs, or sweet unneed, wanton summoning, daily appeal that never staled nor lost its sudden music, and her lovely speed, sedulous, occupation left, quick breathing, with great glad eyes and eager parted lips, or in deep quiet moments, murmuring that name like a religion in her ear, and her calm look compelled to ecstasy. Or to the river luring her, or breathed over her dainty slumber, or secret sweet bridal outpantings of her broken name. All this as rushed unintermitting waves upon a swimmer overborne broke on him, relentless, things too happy to be endured, till faint with the recall to felicity, lo, he moaned out, O pale Priyambada, O dead fair flower, yet living to my grief, but I could only slay the innocent tree, powerless when power should have been. Not such was Brigu, from whose sacred strength I spring, nor Brigu's son, my father, when he blazed out from Puloma's side and burning, blind, fell like a tree, the ravisher unjust. But I degenerate from such sires. O death, that showest not thy face beneath the stars, but comest masked, and on our dear ones seizing, fearest to wrestle equally with love, nor from thy glooming house any come back to tell thy way. But, oh, if any strength in lover's constancy to torture dwell earthward to force a helping God and such ascetic force be born of lover's pain, let my dumb pangs be heard. Whoever thou art, O thou bright enemy of death, descend and lead me to that portal dim, for I have burnt in fires, cruel as the fire, and lain upon a sharper couch than swords. He ceased, and heaven thrilled, and the far blue quivered, as with invisible downward wings.